thank you for the grace tonight. Thank you that we can tangibly feel that grace tonight. So while we're worshiping, I just felt Jesus just encourage us and, and tell us that we don't need to wait for settings like this and moments like this to experience His presence. We don't need to come to church on Sundays just to, to experience Him and have time of, of corporate worship, although it is so awesome and so blessed. He invites us into, into the, into just like the Benakamer, you know, just like the, the quiet place. And He longs to be with us. Just like we sang praises to Him tonight in this place. So Lord, we pray tonight that this won't be a one-stop thing on a Sunday, Lord, but may it be a deepening relationship with the Father, the, the, the Spirit, and of the Son. And may tonight bless your name. Thank you, Lord. We come in humility to you tonight. We say thank you for this gathering. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome, guys. Can we just give the band a... Uh, on the club. What an awesome time in worship. Um, you guys showed some great composure. <laughs> awesome, guys. So, so I'm going to, before we transition into the offering, I'm just going to pray for us for the offering. Lord, thank you for, for an awesome time in worship. But thank you, Lord, we've, we've approached the part of the service where, where it is also an invitation to worship you, Lord. So thank you, Lord, that we can worship you with something like an offering, Lord. Lord. We pray that it would bless your name. We pray that it would not just be a, a ticking of a box or something that we've, has been passed down to us because we did it when we were small with our, with our parents in church, Lord. But may this time of offering, whether it be an offering or a tithe or whatever we bring, Lord, may it bless your name and may it be right with your heart. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So you guys are welcome to, to come to the front. Offering boxes are stationed over there. So um, those of you who have a physical offering to bring, you guys are welcome to put it into the offering boxes. Otherwise, we, our banking details are available online. Whilst we take up the offering, we're just going to play the Bible school video. So stay tuned. No Bible school video. The... Um, the projector is not going to sleep. So let's, so yeah, let's just take up the offerings. So you guys are welcome to come to the front, and then we'll transition after that. Awesome. I like that we've built in a Bible study time, a group work time. Uh, that is, let's take this passage in our group, in our class, unpack it, and study the scripture. Bible school is a communal activity. You're not the only one who's going to do Bible school. There's a whole community of studying, whether you're sitting in a class or enrolling online. There's a whole community of people who have the same passion as you, who study God's word, and you'll enrich one another. You will gain friendships and partnerships with God in Bible school. We engage with the Word while we grow spiritually because we, we come to know the author of the Word when we study the Word. And Bible school gives us that opportunity to, within community, learn about the Bible and become effective uh, disciples of Jesus Christ. By deciding to enroll for Bible school, really just demonstrates an intentionality uh, a purposefulness about us to say to God, I want to I wanna block out uh, two, three hours, whatever it might be, per week, and I want to make sure that I give you dedicated time. Dedicated time to spend in the Word. 
you're going to get to understand the Word. You're going to get to, like the Bible says, handle the Word of God rightly. To know how to use it. To not deal with it loosely or clumsily, but to get to know and to get to love the Bible. I want to encourage all of you guys, if you haven't done Bible school yet, go for it. Awesome. So that's Bible school. I really want to encourage you guys, come check it out. So we're starting off on the 28th of Feb. Okay, so the first three sessions are for free. So come, come around. It is right here at church. It is from half past six up until, until around about nine-ish. All right, so come join us for Bible school. It is really awesome. Um, yeah, it's an awesome time with believers where we're just delving to the Word of God. All right, so it is my privilege to invite our guest onto the stage. Simone, if you can come join me on stage. That would be awesome. If we can give Simone a round of applause. She made her entrance a bit earlier. But, um, yeah, man, we just, just want to make use of this, of this moment. So she doesn't need much introducing, so I'm going to leave it up, up to her to, to do that. Uh, so I think it's her second time visiting us. Um, yeah, so it's good to have you back, Simone. Thank you for the trouble that you've, you've went through to come and join us. Um, yeah, so we're just going to pray for her. So if you guys feel comfortable with just stretching out your hand towards her as I, I pray for her. Lord, thank you for this moment. Thank you, Lord, that we can just pray for our, our sister Simone. Lord, Lord, it's not about her. It's about you. Thank you, Lord, that even with her lips and her tongue, Holy Spirit, may you bless her and, and guide her in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Awesome. Hello, hello. <laughs> it's so good to be here. Um, can I ask whom of you are English, English speaking? Amazing. That's amazing. Okay, so I am, I'm obviously, is it English or English? Okay, I got it right. I've been getting it wrong the whole week. Um, I'll just get speaking English, and um, excuse me if I throw in a little bit of Afrikaans, like it's a pretty um, Oh, I love you guys so much. I love Porch. Uh, like I said earlier, we have like our best friends stay here. So we don't have a choice but to be completely bought into what God is doing here because we get updates all the time. And um, it's just so good to have friends who oh, change the world anyway. So I obviously love the theme of... Oh, I just want to ask as well, who of you are first years? Oh, hello. Give a club. Let's just give them a hand. Welcome. That's amazing. I really pray that you will find a home away from home in this community. I know it's a. F um, I studied in Stellenbosch, and it was obviously a bit far from, from home. And, um, and I was in Shofar Stellenbosch. I joined as a first year. I went on their first year's camp. I got baptized at um, Shofar Stellenbosch. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, got filled with the Holy Spirit in Stellenbosch. I, I, like, the Lord healed me from so much in, during my time um, on campus. I, it was a stage that I didn't want to come to church anymore because I cried too much. I couldn't stop crying. I would walk into church and I would just, I would be wrecked until I got home and then I would be fine again. And at one stage I was like, too much, Jesus, too much. I can't even need it. Too much. I'm like dehydrating from crying. Um, but I had such an encounter with God the Father. Like that's where, where the Lord revealed me his Father heart, which wasn't something I was quite uh, familiar with. And so it completely wrecked my life. And I think that's why I was just undone with that message the whole time that God is a good father. And what is a father, you know? So that was a big part of my story. And, um, and I just pray for every first year that that'll be your story as well, that you have been brought here for a reason to act, get a degree, <laughs> to be excellent in your studies, but also that you may encounter the Lord in such a fresh way he can undug the wells and really come and show you who you are. Through community, church is important. Um, fellowship is important. Bible school is important. Spending time in the Word is important. Worship is important. Um, but I really pray that your time in Porsche is fulfilling and that the Lord will fulfill his purposes for you. Anyway, my mom's Mons Claude. Now I see why I needed two glasses. Anyway. 
Um, so obviously the theme for tonight, what's my dad? Countdown. I think I have less left than 30 minutes, so I just need to keep my eyes on the clock. Um, I obviously love the theme of tonight. The theme is tell your story, and um, by nature, I am a storyteller. That's like my bread. It's the fuel for me. I um, am a creative. I was born into a story. The, God, the Lord wrote a story with my life, and I'll get to it now. But I also just love storytelling. Like as a child, I would um, sit hours and hours and consume Disney like videos. You know the videos that you still put into a video player by an admin. But anyway, I spent. I'm an only child, so I didn't have siblings to play with. So I just had Disney videos. <laughs> Back then, Disney was still innocent. And um, anyway, <laughs> discernment. Um, so anyway, so, so I actually, like, stories filled my life and it spurred my imagination and actually created a playground for me to get to know the Lord in it. Because through stories, you see something of your own life and the Lord can talk to you through it. And so that's my desire for you tonight is obviously to see aspects of my story and see how the Lord is, what the Lord is telling you through that. Um, anyway, so for you who do not know me, <laughs> you gave me the privilege of introducing myself, which is great because I actually prepared that. Um, my name is Simone Pretorius. Um, I, I'm not going to say my age. I'm a millennial. Um, I am a wife to Andres. He's not here. I think he's running for the second service. Um, he is the most incredible husband that the Lord, well, the Lord only gave me one husband, but he is the most incredible um, second to Jesus. And that's not like religion speaking. Like he's really, Jesus is my first love. <laughs> like really. But Andres is a great second. <laughs> um, yeah, Andres is amazing. I really just want to, to every young woman in, in the room that's still single, um, who have a desire for a godly marriage, it is possible. It truly is possible. I didn't know that it could be possible to be in a marriage that is not perfect, but truly glorifies Jesus because his love is revealed through us and in us and to one another. Um, I always knew that there would be a generational cycle that would be broken in my marriage. Like the divorce would stop in my after my generation. Like single mother would stop, divorce would stop, fatherlessness would stop. That was the promise from God. And I waited and I did not settle. So wait for the husband that God has for you. So it's by a single Macy's heat. I really felt like I needed to say this to you. Okay, it's worth it to wait. It's worth it to wait. Okay. Um, I'm married to the, uh, Andres, who is amazing. Um, I am a mom to Harbour. Um, she is very cute. She looks like her dad, but she is like her mom. And that's really a big problem. <laughs> because we really stump Cooper a lot. And she's not even two yet. So pray for me. <laughs> It's great. God has a sense of humor. He gives you a child like you are, and then he's like, this is the patience that I have with you, Simone. So it's a great eye-opener, but she's amazing. She's the best thing that's ever happened to us. Um, I'm an actress, um, literally a storyteller. I love my tribe. I am, I am, I've been given the mandate to tell stories, um, but to also love on the people who also tell stories. Um, so I get very protective over the people whom I feel the Lord called me to. Um, they are not perfect, but if you, if you are called to be light, then why would you stay in the light? You go into the darkness to carry the light. And so I love them because I've asked the Lord to give me a love for, for the tribe to whom I am sent to. I want to encourage you to do it as well. Whatever career path, whatever you are studying, ask the Lord to give you a heart for the people and the tribe to whom you have been called. Um, he wants to do that for you. Um, I'm an actress. I am also a screenwriter. I'm writing stories as well, a series and a film or two, and I'm starting to direct next year. And I'm also presenting, sorry, I have to do this little plug. I'm presenting an acting course in Portugal called The Art of Acting. And um, so it's from the 24th to the 26th of March here at Gukua. Thank you for the venue. Um, so if anyone is interested in acting, I know that you guys don't have a drama Department, but if you feel like there's something in you that you know that it's in you, um, 
Yes, it's a very safe space, and I love training, and it's amazing. So I still have space for 10 people in port. Um, sign up. Uh, and then, most importantly, just a part of the introduction, um, I, I love Jesus. Um, in, if, if a CD needs to be read, I, mean, I don't care if anything else is put on, but I wish and my desire is that my life may be known um, as an act of worship to him. He, um, he has changed my life completely. Um, he has drawn me from the pit. I have been suicidal. I... I did not know who I was. He has freed me from so much. Like the list is so long. So I, I owe him my life, and for the rest of my life, hopefully, my life belongs to him. My heart belongs to him. He is Lord over my life. And there was something very um, special about what we sung when we sang, um, my beloved is the most beautiful among thousands and thousands. And I think that that's what happens when when Jesus becomes the one God. Because we, we're not in a culture where we worship different gods, like different in new age or whatever gods, you know. Our, our other gods don't have names. Our gods, the ones whom the Lord has to fight for our affection, whom we have to fight to give all our affection to him, are things like romance, marriage, academics, name it, finances, money, status, popularity. Those are the things that we naturally start to worship if Jesus is not on the throne of our heart. And it's going to cost you to put him on the throne of your heart. You're going to have to kill the other idols. But he is the most beautiful among thousands and thousands and thousands of things fighting for your affection. He is the one thing that will keep you through trials, through dark, dark times. When you feel like you lose everything, he is the one thing that we have been clinging to. And it has been so beautiful. What comes out of you when you are being crushed is a fragrance that cannot come out of you when there is no crushing. And he says that he draws near to the brokenhearted. If you are brokenhearted tonight, he draws near. He doesn't say, they draw near to me. He says, he specifically states that those who are brokenhearted, I will come to. I come to you when you are brokenhearted. Blessed are those who mourn. I don't know if there are some of you that go, that's, you might be going through something, but I just felt like that was a word for you. Anyway, so, my story. I just want to say, is he your idea? Yeah. Is he so? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just felt to I just felt to lift you out. I, like Eoda, I know her from my Stellenbosch days, my university days. Actually, with Bar, I could Bar came with Stone. See Stone. I've known that woman since university. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to do it. And I also think it's because I know that you've heard the story like a billion times and you are still here. <laughs> and when I saw you, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll put some new jokes in or say something new just so it's exciting for you. But I just want to honor you that you are obedient to the word of God over your life. And I'm so, I'm so excited that God sent you here as a pillar to strengthen the church because you three are like a polis. <laughs> you go where he sends you. And I just want to honor you. You are a mother of the house. You carry a mantle of motherhood over your life. And other people can find shelter in that. And you don't have to be a literal mother to do that. You are one of the people that carry motherhood without being a mother, that you inspire me on the selflessness of your love. I will encourage you. It's amazing. It's just, can you just give her a hand? Anyway, okay, finally the story. So, when I was born, who felt tired to take that? Well, cool, cool. Okay, I have a movie version for now. 
Um, so I, when, when I was born or when my mom felt pregnant with me, that was in 1989. My mom was in the South African Air Force. Uh, she was a woman in uniform. She's been working in the Air Force for 10 years. She was 30 years old at the time. She was working for like the general of the South African Air Force. So she was quite well known in that time. She had worked so hard. She was very career driven. Um, don't want to know anything about men until she met my father. He's quite handsome. And um, that was a bit of a problem for her because then she felt pregnant. Oops, whops, oopsie. Um, <laughs> oopsie doopsie. <laughs> and um, they were not married. Um, and in that time, there was a policy in the South African Air Force that stated, if you fell pregnant outside of wedlock, then you are going to lose your job. So many women in that time, whom that happened to, uh, had to make a decision. Either they lose their jobs, uh, or, and, and the fact is that they didn't necessarily study to get into the Air Force, so they didn't have anything to fall back on. So it's not like you work, you are into HR or whatever, and then you can go from one company to the next. If you are in the Air Force, that's probably your career path for the next 30, 40 years. So she was in this situation, she's been in the force for like 11 years, and suddenly there's the situation in front of her. And many women in that time either uh, got fired, or they went for an abortion, or they gave their children up for adoption to be able to keep their jobs. And my father didn't necessarily want to get married, uh, so my mother felt like she had no choice and she went for an abortion. So, this is an interesting part because you guys obviously know what happened, but just act like you don't know what happened. <laughs> okay. Just act like this is a part of the movie where you're like, what happened? <laughs> Did the abortion? Anyway, so she went to an abortion clinic, um, but when she tested it for her pregnancy, she had blood test done, which means that there was obviously a paper printed with the blood results, she is pregnant. It's not like a stocky that you pee pee on, which I feel is the natural thing to do, but anyway, she didn't do that, so it was like black on white, on paper, oh, black on paper, that that is the situation. And so she goes to an abortion clinic in South Africa. It was still illegal in that time. And when she went to it, the doctor recognized her. I don't know how. And he said to her, I, I, I feel like it's the fear of God that came over him. And he said, I cannot perform this because somewhere there is a document that states that you are pregnant. And if anyone finds that, they're going to ask, why is she not pregnant anymore? And then naturally they're going to find out that I did it and I don't want to get locked up. So, Yamar, I'm not going to perform the abortion. I feel like he had a bit of a big imagination, but praise God, that's fine. Anyway, and so she uh, decided to go to a second abortion clinic. And in that time, South Af the South African government put pressure on the neighboring countries to change their abortion laws. Because the Botswana, Zimbabwe, all of the Birlande were still pro-abortion. And so the South African government put pressure on them to change that. And there was an article in the Heisgenoot of all, of all Tijdsgrote. <laughs> there was an article in the Heisgenoot about the South African government and this, this thing that they are pressure that they're putting on the other countries. And my mom was like, yes, there is still a window period for me to go before they change the laws in those countries. And so she goes to Botswana, she gets to the abortion clinic, and when she gets there, the receptionist looks at her and she's like, I am so sorry. I had to cancel your appointment because the doctor is overseas for research. I'm, I, we can't perform this. Like, swear yammer. When they didn't speak Afrikaans, I'm so sorry. <laughs> So my mom has to turn back. She comes back to South Africa, and the receptionist promises her. She's like, next week, Friday, at 2 p.m. This is, I'm writing it down. We're definitely open. He will be here. We'll see you next week, Friday, at 2 p.m. My mom drives back to South Africa. She goes back to Botswana, and that afternoon, the, the, that Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., when she gets there, the abortion clinic was closed down that morning because the laws in the land were changed in that week. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> My life was saved because, because of that law. My life was saved. So the police closes down. They, put, they close down the clinic that morning. That afternoon, my arrive, the clinic is closed down third time. 
She goes back to South Africa. She goes to an underground clinic in South Africa, dodgy vibes. When she gets there, they ask her, how many weeks are you? She says, 12, 13 weeks. And they say, we're so sorry. We can't perform the procedure. Your life would be in danger after 12 weeks. And we can't take that. We can't take that um, risk. We can't take that risk. So sorry. Fourth time. The fifth time, she got uh, kidding, there wasn't a fifth time. <laughs> Hallelujah, she stopped. <laughs> she stopped. My mom put me up for adoption. She sees a social worker. Um, and on the 11th of May, 1990, she sits across from the social worker. And the social worker looks at her and she says, Dickie, I am not supposed to tell you this, uh, but I really feel she was a believer. She said, I really feel like you will make an exceptional mom. Are you sure about this decision? And my mom gets all flattery and anxious, and she's like, ah, I'm just a son. I need to run, because I see, oh, they're giving me a traffic fine. So I'm going to go, and then I'll see you in a week's time, and then I'll sign the adoption papers, because she was supposed to sign the documents on that day. I had a different family and everything. And so she thinks that she has time left, because she still has a month left of a pregnancy. And a few days after, after the South African Air Force finds out that she's pregnant, she goes into shock labor, and two hours later, skitak eyes is a pile at the boer. Okay? My mom's like, oh, you were so fast. And I'm like, yes, because I was so glad I'm alive. I'm like, I'm not staying inside any longer. I don't know what you're going to do with me, woman. I'm coming. <laughs> And by nature, I'm quite an impatient person. I feel like the Lord used it in my birth already. Anyway, he can use anything. So, um, so I shoot out, in her words. And, uh, and because it was a month too early, and the gynecologist that was supposed to deliver me was not there. He was also gone on holiday or something. A locum doctor stood in, um, in, in his place. He delivered me. No one knew I was an adoption baby, because it was like, my mom, ah! so much pain. I can't think of the fact that I should tell them that I'm not keeping the baby. And the papers are not there. The signed documents are not there. Nothing is ready. I am there. And they put me on my mom's chest. And you are not supposed to do that with an adoption baby. If your child is put up for adoption, you take the baby immediately out of the, out of the theater. And so I'm on my mom's chest. And she says, I just looked at her like this. <laughs> what you going to do? <laughs> And she said, I didn't even cry. I just looked at her. And so a day or two after, I was in the NICU. It was in a, in a brewery cask. I can't remember what it is. Incubator. I'm in the incubator, and, uh, but I'm quite healthy so that like, the sisters can take me out and feed me and everything. And the first time that she visits me is... 24 hours after with her social worker and her best friend because they just want to see what the baby looks like. And so they look, they're at the window and they're looking at all the incubators. And there's one incubator without a name, just a baby wrapped in pink. And so this baby starts crying, it's me. I start crying. <laughs> just in case you think it's someone else. <laughs> and so I start crying and the nurse takes me out and she looks at my mom, and they're like, can they try to comfort me? <laughs> and so they, the sister brings me to my mother's best friend, and she tries to comfort me, and nothing works. So I just cry, I scream my lungs out. And she passes me to the social worker, and she's like, oh, she tries to comfort me, and nothing is working. And they just look at my mom, and my mom's like, okay, God. And my mom takes me in her arms, and I just look at her again, and I stop crying. And in that moment, my mom says, with the locking of eyes, she knew that she would give the world for the baby. And she decided to keep me, and she decided, I will lose everything, I will lose my job, it doesn't matter, I'm keeping my child. Which is the thing that the Lord has been speaking to her from the beginning, but she didn't want to listen. <laughs> because she was fending for herself. It was an act of self-protection. What else, what other option do I have, God? I have to do this. Not really leaning into what he wanted her to do. 
But when my mom chose obedience, favor fell on her decision, and the Air Force had a disciplinary hearing for her. And because she was an excellent soldier and they had nothing else to find against her, she could keep her job. And not only that, they changed the policy so that other women didn't have to give up their children to keep their job. My mom became the first woman in the South African Air Force to keep a baby and her job. Praise Jesus. Yes. It's quite amazing. Um, because that's what happens when you choose obedience. There will be fruit to your decision, and God honors that, and he honored that with my mother's life. Anyway, um, a few months go by, my father decides to make the right decision and to get married to my mom. I think it's because I really look like him a lot, and people knew. <laughs> and so, as socks of my, anyway. Um, <laughs> And so they get married a few months after, uh, but they don't stay together for long because anything born out of obligation cannot be sustained. Right? It's the same with religion. It's where there's obligation. We cannot sustain love. It has to come from a pure place. Jesus, you love me so much, I cannot help but love you back. Here is my love from that place. That's not obligation. That's a true response to love. My mom didn't have that. And anyway, a few years after, their marriage came to an end. And so it's me and my mom. I don't have any siblings. My mom never got married again. And it was just the two of us. Um, and I saw my father every now and then, but not a lot. And then he moved to Cape Town. And I didn't see him much during my life. But I, I just want to also honor him. I know that there's a road that I've walked. Um, my father isn't perfect, but he is amazing. And I really believe in God's plans and purposes for his life as well. So if you need to be reconciled to a parent, if one of your parents, there's been a disappointment, I stand as a testament to you today that God can redeem that in your heart. And maybe you will not have the perfect relationship with your parents on earth, but you can have a perfect relationship with your parents in heaven one day if you continue to pray for them. And Jesus can do that. If we get to a place of forgiveness, he can really help you. And it's been many years, to be able to stand in front of you and say, I love and honor both my parents. They did not know what they were doing, and I forgive them. And through that forgiveness, so much healing t took place in my heart, and that is possible for you as well. So anyway, but the road I walked was a bit difficult. I really struggled with rejection. And struggled feels like such a light word to use. I was tormented by rejection to the point of depression, uh, intense social anxiety. I had these ambitions and I and I, like, I wanted to strive and perform for love. But on the other hand, I was so shy and scared of people's rejection. So it was like these two things working against one another during my entire school career. So I was with my scene in primary school. I was with my scene in high school. I was with my scene on campus. Uh, with my scene. I was with my scene on campus. ASAR, I was on the SRC. But most of that came from striving, wanting to have a title so that I can feel important, so that at least when I walk into a room, I am important. And people can be like, oh, she's important. So that that could be my identity. So I've been striving for these things, but inside I was so deeply, deeply broken and deeply insecure and deeply plagued by rejection that I did not even actually want enter any other room. In, in, on campus, on university, I didn't want to go to class because all eyes would be on me. There was this class psychology or something where the, the rows were like this, like amphitheater, and the entrance to the room was like down here. And when you entered, everyone would look at you. And I would, I would just not go to that class. I don't know how I made that class. I think the Holy Spirit helped me. But um, compassion. But I was a mess. I was such a mess. Anyway, so in high school, my friends would be like, oh, this boy, this taste, this things, and I would just not want to wake up in the mornings, put one foot in front of the other. I was so plagued by heaviness all my life, and no one knew. Those whom I shared it with said to me, oh, well, that's on. Okay. Didn't understand. And so I've been told to just tough it up, you know, just take it on. 
But the one thing was that even when I was little, I would always imagine myself talking to Jesus. So at night, when I would go go to bed, I would just talk to Jesus. I think it helps being an only child because there was no one else. So I would just like talk to Jesus. I'd like ride my little bike and talk to Jesus. And sometimes in the car, like I would, we would drive by situations that would really like break my heart, and I would feel the compassion of God for the the poor and for, for certain people in certain situations and I would cry because Jesus was sad. So there was there was his accompaniment even when I didn't necessarily knew him, knew him intimately. He's just like been part of my life from the beginning. Even before I realized that he was even with me in my mother's womb. And so in 2006, I went on a church camp. I was oh, 16, 15 years old. And I went to a Winkelsprite camp, and there was this band. And I actually went because I liked this boy called Lawrence. Um, that's why I went, 100% why I went. And he didn't like me back. Silas. <laughs> <laughs> he actually went for another girl on this camp, which absolutely broke my heart, and ushered me to the arms of Jesus. He uses everything. <laughs> So I'm on this camp, and I'm like, <laughs> Lauren's kiss buddy, oh, anybody kiss buddy, everyone hates me, oh, I'm a worm. But that, okay, I'm kidding now, but that was really, really, that was like, that was in my heart, I really hated myself. And I could not understand that anyone could love me unconditionally. And I stood there, and the pastor had this rope in his hand, oh, like a rope tied from the one corner of the room to the other corner of the room, a big rope, and everyone in the room had small little ropes. And he said, he gave this whole thing about Jesus, and he spoke to us about Jesus being the vine, and we are the branches. And if we are not rooted in him, then we can do nothing. And he is the source of all life. He's the source of joy. He's the source of purpose. And something stirred in my heart. Life, where all I know is death. Joy, where all I know is depression. Purpose, when I've been plagued by the questions, why am I here my entire life? Because I found out about everything that happened with my mom and, and with a pregnancy. So these questions were mine. Why did you save me, God, to deliver me over to depression? Why keep me alive when every day is torturous? When I cannot access what everyone says I can find in you. And so there came a time when the pastor said, if you want to give your life to Jesus, tie your small rope to the bigger rope. And all of my friends were like, la la di da doop de doop de doop like tying it, links and that, and doing it so easily. And I stood with it in my hand, and I was like, burning. <laughs> I was so angry with God. And everyone left the room, but I knew that I had business with him. I knew that if I do not sort this thing out in my heart now, then it's over. Then I'm never turning back. So either, God, you meet me here in my mess, in my pain, in my anguish, or I'm done. And so everyone left the room and got hot chocolate and mingled with Lawrence, and I stood in the room... (laughs) with Jesus. <laughs> I stood in the room alone, and it was me and him. I closed my eyes, and I, I, was just, I just felt like I had to wait on him. And in one moment, I kid you not, it was the most supernatural thing I've ever experienced. The love of God hits me out of nowhere, like a big wave, literally, I'm standing in a sea, and this wave hits me in the face, and it feels like I'm filled with the love of God, the purest form of love that I have ever tasted in my life. And I know for the first time in my life, I am completely loved. The God of the universe sees everything that's going on inside of me. The resentment, the bitterness, the unforgiveness, the insecurity, the jealousy, the comparison, the lying, the striving, the performance, the brokenness. And he loves me. Purely. Every part of me. He's like, I want you. Nessie I is. You don't have to do anything just the state that you are in now, you are lovely to me. I want everything. 
And so I fall to my knees and I'm crying and crying. And he said three things to me that has marked my life forever. I will never forget it. First thing he said to me is, Simone, I have loved you with an everlasting love before you could love me back. I chose you before the foundation. That was actually in scripture. Later on, I was like, this is in the Bible. He said this to me. It's here. I've loved you with an everlasting love. I chose you before the foundation of the world that you may know me through my son, Jesus. Before you can do anything for me, I chose you. I went to the cross with your sinful state. I chose you first, full stop. There's nothing you can do to, do to earn my love. There's no position. There's no serving in church. There's no Bible school. There's no missions. There's nothing, not a next that you can do to earn what I want to give you unconditionally. Free, free for cost. There's no cost to it. The cost is your life. <laughs> but it's easy. It's easy when you know his love. And so that's the first thing he said to me. I loved you before you could love me back. Second thing he said to me is, I have a plan with your life. I needed to hear it. I was plagued by the question, why am I here? I'm not the kind of person that can just do things for the sake of doing them. I want to know why. Now I'm a bit better at surrendering, you know. But generally, my personality is, I mean, Andres laugh about it. Andres is the type that when he gets on a ship, he doesn't need to know where the ship is going. He just have a good time with everyone on the ship, okay? I'm the kind of person, if you don't tell me where we are going, I will throw myself off the ship. I, will, I would rather drown than not know where we are going. I need to know where we are going. And in that moment, the Lord was like, you may not know where we are going, but I know where we are going, and we are going somewhere. And that's all I needed to know. Security that he has a purpose for my life. He's writing a story, specific story, with my life that he cannot write through anyone else. He's writing story with your life, with your life, with your life that he cannot do through anyone else. Gifts that he has given you, a calling he has bestowed on you. Love, compassion, things that you carry, leadership, mercy, justice, a heart for justice, racial reconciliation. Some of you have these things in your life, and God is like, I put it there for my glory. Maybe the world wants to pervert it and change it and use it for something else. But God is like, uh uh, my. I put the gifts of acting on your life, not for your own platform or your own kingdom. I gave you influence, not for yourself, for me, hello. I'm like, yeah, what's that? <laughs> so you, there's a purpose for your life. Third thing he said to me was, you have to forgive your parents. I was very angry, very, very angry, continuously disappointed continuously abandoned over and over and over again. It was hard. But I knew that if those were the three things that he wanted to say to me in his first encounter with me face to face, then he really is serious about it. And now looking back, he was really serious about forgiveness. He is. Because he forgives those whom we forgive. Do you know the weight of that? That God limits himself in forgiveness until we say, okay, Lord, I release them. I forgive them. God's like, been waiting for this, thank you. We get to partner with him through forgiveness in other people's deliverance, in other people's getting to know him, in other people's freedom. Sometimes it depends on you forgiving them. That's radical. And so I was like, okay, I will forgive them, but you need to help me. So I can't get myself to any. And he's like, no problem. I'm like, the, I'm in the business of forgiveness. And so he shows me Jesus on the cross. And it, this was really the key that unlocked it for me, and I want to give this to you. He shows me Jesus on the cross, and he says, Jesus is on the cross, and he's looking at the very people that literally murdered him. He came for them. 
He was like, I am here for you. I become human to relate to you so that you can see, put a face to the God that you've been worshiping for years. I come to serve you. I come to lay down my life for you. I come to wash your feet. You betray me and you kill me. And Jesus is on the cross and he's looking into the face of those who killed him. And he says to the Father, forgive them because they just don't know. If Meaning, if they knew who I was, they would not have done it. If they knew the gift of God in front of them, they would not have murdered him. If my parents knew what a blessing I am, (laughs) they would not have done it. If my parents knew who they were, if they knew how trustworthy God was, that he makes a way in the most difficult decisions, in the most trickiest parts, even in my mess, I had had sex outside of marriage. It was a mistake. God's like, I can redeem that. Give it to me. My mom didn't know. And so God's like, if she knew, she would not have done it. If your father knew, he wouldn't do it. And so I was like, okay, Jesus, I also don't know. I forgive because who am I to withhold forgiveness when you forgive me of everything? So that's for you. Three things he said that marked me. That the band can come up. So... I gave my heart to Jesus. I kept those things clo- three things close to my heart. And it's been, oh, my viskende, 14, 17 years. 2006, yeah. I studied drama. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's been 17 years of walking with Jesus. And it's, It's been a struggle. I'm not going to lie to you. You're going to have to continually say yes to what he wants to do in your heart. Because no one, none of us are perfect. I'm sure that you are sitting with a lot of things that you are grappling with, wrestling with. I actually felt like in first year when I got filled with the Holy Spirit and I was just like this whole world opened up for me. It, It felt to me when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, or actually just when I met Jesus, it felt to me like I knew him from church, and all of the things, sauna school. Like I knew about him, but it felt like I was in this gallery of a house, these paints. And like this was what I knew of God. And suddenly Jesus opens the door of that scullery of the spains. He rips it open. Light fills that dark room. And he's like, can I show you the house? And there's a whole house that's mine. And I thought it was just this. This is what it was. But Jesus opens the door into the house. And you're like, sloop in the water. There's a bed. There's a TV. There's a All of it, you have access to whatever you long for. There is so much for you in the Father's house. I never thought I would be 32 years old. I never thought I would make 32 years old because I tried to take my own life. But I'm 32 years old and I'm standing on on like ground and I'm looking back at my life and I'm like, how? How did you deliver me from all of that? Is it possible? Am I whole? Wow. I carry joy. What? I am alive. I feel gratitude where all I felt was entitlement. Shame? What a shame. Everything that disqualified me in my life previously, he took that. He took unforgiveness. He showed me the Father. The Father? Wow. You can stand with me. So I guess my story is 
that you do not have to stay where you are. There is permission for you and there is hope for you. If I can stand, if, if I, of all people, that's like, I, the enemy tried to take me out in my mom's womb. I was plagued by a spirit of rejection from my mother's womb. I didn't stand a chance if it wasn't for Jesus. He took me from my mother's womb, took my hand, just enclosed me, and decided that I was his for the rest of my life. And every time I tried to run, he would bring me back with his love and be like, just stay here. You will grow into my love. I promise you, I will not leave you. I will not abandon you. I will not, I am not your parents. I'm not your mom. I'm not your father who walked out. I'm not the house you came from that's broken. I'm not the parents you have that scream at each other. I'm not, I'm not the parents who choose other siblings above you. I'm not the friend who bully you. I'm not the romantic partner who walked out on you. I'm not the husband who left you. I am not that. I'm not insecure. I do not manipulate you. I do not use my power against you. I am not abusive. I do not have addictions. I am faithful. I am secure. I am love. Not I have love. God does not say in the word, I have love to give you. He says, I am love. I am fill in the gaps. Fill in what you need tonight. I am unconditional love. I am the force of forgiveness that will empower you to forgive. I am the force of love that will hit you in the face with my love, bringing you to your knees, and I will mark you with my purpose. I am purpose. I am peace in your anxiety. I am joy in your depression, but I have to get what you have for me to give you all I am. There is a transaction that needs to take place. He cannot fill what is already filled with something else. We need to be empty to receive what he has to give. So will you do that transaction tonight? So with our eyes closed, I'm going to ask you to be brave because you're Gen Z and God is asking you to walk on the water, okay? So if you are at that place where I was in 2006, I have no idea who I am. I'm so broken. I'm so tormented. I think I know God, but I do not have an intimate relationship with Him. In fact, I don't even think I've actually heard the voice of God. If I die tonight, I am actually not sure what will happen to me. I am not secure in the salvation of Jesus. If you went through like I did in 2006, give your life to Jesus, will you raise your hand? Come on, thank you for that. Your lives are ch literally changing right now. Right now, heaven is rejoicing because of your raised hand. They're like, yes, yes. There's a cloud of witnesses that have been surrounding you, just like cheering you on to give your life to Jesus. So if that is you, you just raise your hand. Will you please come to the front? Just be bold, walk on the water and give your life. Hallelujah. Come on. Yes. Yes. Give them a hand. Anki, thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes, 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 yes. This will never, never get old. Never. <laughs> That's your norm. Lenai, he loves you so much. And he says that everything in your life he's going to use for your good. Every single thing. Every, every single thing. And every obstacle in front of you, he will personally roll out of your way. And it's not going to take effort. You don't have to do it. Come on. I just want to honor you for your obedience. I know, it's, I know it's tough to come to the front in front of all of these people. 
there are facilitators, will you please come lay your hands on them? Thank you for coming to the front. I honor you. I honor you. I honor you. I honor you. Okay, so we're just going to say the sinner's prayer. Because the Bible says when we confess with our mouths, we believe in our hearts that Jesus is the Lord, that He's the only God, then we are saved. And it's much less about just doing it. It really is that He sees your heart. And it's just an act of putting it into action. Because we know that actions speak louder than words, right? So you can say in your heart, in the seat back there, yes, I'm just I'm giving my life to Jesus. But you coming to the front and saying it and standing in front of everyone, that is the act that you are doing. And God is like, yes, he's in. She's in. All in. Okay. So we just could pray. You can just pray after me. It's just going to help you put a language to, to the words, okay? It's not like I have the right words. It's just the idea, okay? And I think everyone can just pray along. It's just help them because we're a community and we're a family. Okay? This is insane. This is like Porchefstrom is changed because you just gave your lives to Jesus. Do you know that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it may never get old. Never. We cannot become familiar with this because this is where we all started. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, just repeat after me. Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner. I confess, Lord, that I need a Savior. I am desperate for a Savior. I acknowledge tonight, Jesus, that you took my sin on the cross. Forever you dealt with my sin and my past. Your blood covered me. I am completely forgiven. And I now, from this moment, belong to the kingdom of heaven. I am a son and a daughter in the house of God. And I will be with Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Welcome! <laughs> Just gets me. You guys need to read the first three books of the New Testament. Okay. Read them and study them. If you need help, I have an app. It's, no, it's not my app. It's called Read Scripture. It's amazing. It will help you work through the Bible. But if you want to know God, you need to know the Bible. Okay? And not from a place of I to do it out of obligation. We do it because He just saved you. You've just been transformed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal Scripture, to reveal Jesus to you in the Bible. Okay? He, I promise you, He will help you. I promise you, wake up every morning, set time aside in the Word, put on worship music, close your eyes and say, Jesus, I want to meet you. It's practical. It's not airy, fairy stuff. Every morning at 6 o'clock, I wake up because if I do not spend time with Him, I will die. I will die. I will die. Okay? You need to set time apart to spend time with Him. That's the only way you will grow in His love for you. I honor you. Thank you, and I bless you in the name of Jesus. So you can step out with the facilitators. If there's anything specifically you want prayer for, if um, yes, you can. You, you'll talk to them. Whatever prayer needs you have, okay? You can just step up to the side. And then if there's anyone else, I specifically, um, if there's anyone else that struggles with forgiveness, you really struggle to let go of this thing in your heart. Last year we went through a thing and, and people very close to us hurt us very intensely. And it was like, I'm faced with this thing again, Lord. How can I forget? Like, it's, how could they do this? It's like intense betrayal. If it wasn't for Jesus, I promise you, He helps you. He's willing to help you. And if you do not forgive, if you are stuck in that offense, 
It will destroy your life. I'm not, like, this is not a casual thing. Unforgiveness will steal and destroy your life. It is a destructive tool in the hands of the enemy to take you out. Because we become so consumed with what we have been wronged about or for, that we lose our fo- focus on Jesus. So if that's you, if you struggle with forgiveness, will you please come to the front? I just want to pray with you. Thank you. Yeah, I honor you guys. Um, are there more facilitators left in the room? Okay, I'll just do a blank break. Cool. Got some another room. You can just come to the front. What's your name? Solo. Um, I've just been seeing you uh, from where I'm standing. Um, you really have just been highlighted to me. I really feel like the hand of God is very heavy on your life. That you carry something of justice. Do you? Yes, very strongly. And that God is like, I see you walking in front of a movement. Like there's something like, like about starting a movement in your heart. And God says like he's calling you for it, but he will equip you for it. And you have to like, just, I see like it's on your knees. You're not running, leading people. You're on your knees. So even if God cripples you, it's a hard word. But if it's something that he's going to do to text, like, he's doing it with purpose. Okay. But it's because he's called you for something very specific. Okay. Just, I bless you, Tzolo. Okay. Everyone, just come closer. I'm just going to quickly pray. Just stretch out your hands to them. It's really like ma- they're making themselves very vulnerable to say that they're struggling with this. And I just want to also say that this whole revival thing that's breaking out across campuses everywhere, like something that is that is characteristic to the movement that is happening is humility and it's repentance. So the revival at Asbury College started with one guy coming to the front, taking the mic, repenting of his sin, coming to salvation, and applause erupted in the room, resulting into worship that's been going on for 12 days, okay? One person repenting, one person humbling himself. That is what an act of humility does. It's the power of humility. Coming forward for prayer is an act of humility. And God moves when we humble ourselves. He lifts up the humble. He exalts the humble. Just stretch out your hand. I just want to hold out your hands. I want you guys in the front, just close your eyes. But just visualize the person that has hurt you or the people that have hurt you. Just envision just maybe even if it's hard to see their faces. And I want you to see how you put them at the throne room, at the feet of Jesus. But you have to release it. You have to let go. Just open your hands and give it to him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you give us the spirit of reconciliation. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you give them power to forgive, Lord, because you are so serious about forgiveness. I honor them for humbling themselves. I pray, Lord, that you would reveal to them how much they have been forgiven of so that they are able to forgive. I bless them, Lord. I just say on their behalf, Lord, that they who have wronged us are forgiven. In the name of Jesus, we release those who have hurt us, those who have persecuted us, those who have come against us, maybe even thinking that they're doing it in the name of God. Father, will you forgive those who have wronged us? Because they don't know what they are doing. Thank you, Jesus. We surrender it completely. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And they can come under your forgiveness, Lord. And you will make the load lighter for them. I bless them in the name of Jesus. Thank you for their surrender. I just see Jesus releasing peace, peace, peace. Over every one of you. In his name, I bless you guys. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for coming.
was very special. I'm really excited to see what happens on your campus. Lean in and worship and find your community. Okay, I bless you. I bless you. Amen. Bye.